everyone. My name is Faith Gunderson, and I'm the marketing coordinator here at Shea Fritz and Dean. Um, and I want to welcome you to our business builder series. Um, oh, if I can get my slides straight. Um, and thank you for being here. We know you're busy, so we appreciate you giving us your time uh, to make the most of your time. We encourage you to participate and ask questions by utilizing the chat box. Uh, thank you, Faith. Um... Uh, I'm Doug Dean, the owner and managing partner at Shea Fritz and Dean, and we're always trying to find ways to give back to the real estate agent community that we serve. And one way that we've started doing that is our business builder speaker series held mm -hmm. the third Wednesday every month at one o'clock for an hour. We bring speakers uh, who are going to bring uh, engaging, valuable content to help you in your business. So we appreciate you being with us today and uh, appreciate your time. Go ahead, uh, Faith. Uh, and uh, before I introduce Sergio, I want to give a little um, introduction into or glimpse into what next month's speaker will be. Um, before, but before I even do that, I just want to put a disclaimer out that there is um, no need to put your license number or anything in the chat as this is not for CE credits. Um, it is just for um, value and um, to answer any questions. So there is no need to do that. Um, but next month in April, we um, are going to have the founder and CEO of Dorsey, Jordan Allen. He will be joining us on April 20th at 1 p.m. He will be presenting um, how to get more listings and sell homes um, for top dollars. So we're looking forward to that. Dorsey is a really cool business um, and there will be more details on that later. So welcome, Sergio, take it away. Uh -huh. Thanks, Faith. Uh, thank you, Doug, for the invitation. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sergio Ayala. I am the um, commercial coach and mentor with uh, Maximum One Executives uh, and also their commercial division, which is MX1 Executives Commercial. I'm also the uh, technology director for them. And I do uh, wear many hats, of course. And nowadays, um, we do have three offices, Alfreda, Duluth, and Buford. And um, I do have my office in uh, the Duluth office in Saddle, and that's where I actually attend a lot of my uh, mentees as well. So thanks again for the invitation. Sergio, Doug, thanks, go ahead, thanks for being, uh, Sergio, thanks for being with us today. Uh, we appreciate uh, you giving your time and we're excited to uh, hear what you have to tell us. Go ahead. Yeah, so thank you again for the invitation. So um, I know I talked to Faith. She wanted me to talk a little bit more about how I started in the business and uh, what really in, entails in the commercial world. Um, you know, nowadays uh, it is considered that a lot of the residential agents transitioning into commercial, we call it uh, resumercial. And there's actually quite a few brokerages nowadays uh, who practice these resumercial, um, you know, mentality or concept where a lot of uh, residential agents have encountered commercial opportunities. And of course they transition slowly but surely into the commercial world. Um, you know, I can, I can talk about how I started in the business, um, real estate in general. Uh, been licensed since 2002. Prior to that, I was in corporate America in the uh, telecom world. Uh, so obviously I learned a lot of that corporate mentality and how it works out. Um, when I got my license in 2002, I started the, with Cobalt Banker. Uh, at the time, I was doing the part-time. After that, I transitioned to another company. Um, that company actually introduced me to the commercial real estate, um, but I wasn't paying attention to it. And they introduced me in the commercial world because that company had a, a development division, a land development. They also had a builders, a property or residential builders division. And so I started working um, in the uh, development division and uh, residential uh, commercial, or I just say uh, construction division. I worked with seven independent builders. I worked with a developer, on-site developer, engineers, surveyors. So early in my career, even though I had been exposed to the commercial world, I wasn't really paying much attention to it because I was focused more on the residential world, basically. Um, but, you know, let's say fast forward uh, to around 2014 or so, 15. This is when I actually uh, took a plunge into the commercial world uh, as, as a full-time real estate commercial. And I got into the commercial world by actually by an accident. 
Um, so I had a friend introduce me to another friend um, who got entangled in a, in a commercial situation uh, without representation. Um, and I stress that without representation at the time. And so um, the other broker, or, or in this case, the listing broker seemed to be taking advantage uh, of, of their position that the, this particular buyer was not being represented. Um, and that's how they contact me to see if I can help them in the situation. So make a long story short, I did. I was able to help that particular buyer uh, get out of that nasty situation they got in uh, without losing money. Uh, that was a, another big plus, without losing money. And so this particular um, you know, prospect, because it wasn't my client at the time, um, got so impressed the way I was able to get him out of the out of the nasty situation without losing money that he said, you know what, from now on, you are my commercial agent. Uh, so it was kind of a, an accident. Um, but at the time, I was able to prove all the experience that I actually had acquired many years prior to that point. And, you know, without me knowing that knowledge and that experience just came out of the blue, right? Um, so from that moment, I jumped into the commercial world. Um, this particular client, uh, we're obviously still my client today. So I've been working with them for a little bit over seven years, almost eight years. Um, it is a, it is a well-known brand uh, in the automotive industry. I represented them on many transactions on the purchase side, on the, on the sales side, and also on leases uh, as a landlord and as a tenant. Um, and that particular client also has residential uh, investments. So obviously, because of my experience in residential, I was able to help them out on residential deals as well. Um, so, and of course, through that aid, I mean, through that client, um, because, you know, such a great work, I guess I did for them, they start referring me to other uh, automotive uh, industry, you know, businesses. And that's how the word got, you know, spread. And so all of a sudden I was working a lot with um, automotive industry businesses, car dealerships, um, body shops, mechanic shops, uh, auto auctions, um, lots just for parking trucks or, I mean, you name it. And just so kind of grew, it was, it was a snowball effect. It grew into that. Um, I can, I can also honestly say that, um, probably more than 70% of my business is um, word of mouth, uh, referrals, and return business. I, I very rarely, um, or I don't spend a whole lot of money on marketing. Um, and so I've been blessed by that. I'm not saying you should do the same because you do have to invest in your business. Now, in my case, I do invest in my business on the education side. You know, um, I take a lot of classes, courses, seminars, I get coaching as well. Um, I paid significant amount of money uh, to get coached. Uh, I've traveled to uh, other states uh, to to go to coaching uh, seminars and um, you know in, immersive coaching where you have to stay there for you know three four days. And so I do I spend money on my education. Um, that's one thing that you guys definitely should do. Um, and or fortunately, a lot of uh, the agents nowadays, not only in the commercial world, but in the residential don't do. Um, if I had to make a, a distinction between the commercial and residential agents, I'll be honest with you, most of the commercial agents do spend money in their education. Residential agents don't. Um, they think that because they're getting, you know, three hours uh, free CE here and there from the um, inspection company or from the lender, that's enough education. And it is not. There's a whole lot more to it. Um, in the commercial side, obviously, we have to pay attention to the market, what's going on on a daily basis. We have to keep our finger on the pulse because, you know, there's new developments, new companies. Um, if there's a, a new company moving in town, there's a new development getting built up. All that is going to need employees. All that is going to need contractors. Uh, all that is going to need engineers, surveyors. And you start naming all the different components. And then right after that, what follows? All the residential components, because all these people um, have to live somewhere and they rather live closer to these developments. 
So we have to keep our finger on the pulse basically at all times. Um, I do check a, a few commercial news, commercial real estate news sites on a daily basis. I do get some of them in my email as well on a daily basis because I want to know what's going on. Um, not only uh, so I can have an intelligent conversation, but also so I can advise my clients uh, which route to take. You know what, um, you know, John, I, I heard some news that, or I saw some news this morning and this development that you were thinking about, I don't think is a good idea anymore because of this, because of this happening here. I'd rather you move to this side of town instead of um, for whatever reason. So I think it's super, super important that um, if you guys want to start transitioning into the commercial world, you have to spend money, spend time, or I, I wouldn't say spend money, I'll say invest, invest money in your business and your education and your career, and also um, invest time into knowing what's going on out there as far as uh, the market itself, the news, uh, what's moving, what's shaking, right? The different sectors of it. And that's something I'll talk about in a second because there's many sectors inside the commercial world. When you're talking about residential, it's just residential for the most part. Um, you know, single family residential, maybe multifamily residential, or up to four units, but that's about it. When you're talking commercial, there's many other types of commercial properties. Um, and so again, and that's how kind of I started, how I got immersed into the commercial world. Um, and I haven't looked back ever since. Uh, Faith, you tell me if you got certain topics uh, you want me to hit on. Uh, as far as uh, license, because I know a lot, of, a lot of people ask me, do you need a special license for it? No, you don't. Um, once you're licensed under uh, Georgia, under the Georgia Real Estate Commission, you get your uh, uh, you know, Georgia license. That's the only license you're going to need over here. Now, what I do uh, have to say is, yes, the license is the same. However, the experience and the knowledge is not the same. So you do have to take your time, like I said before, and you know, invest in that education because the business is not the same. The language is not the same. Terminology is not the same. The contracts are not the same. Um, the commissions are not the same. And once you get sued, the amounts are different as well. Uh, so, you know, in essence, uh, there's a lot of big differences between residential and commercial. That's why you have to really take your time. And I'm talking about the differences, um, and you don't have, you don't need a particular license. Within our company, for example, uh, in order for you to do commercial with, it, with our company, you basically have to be a full-time commercial agent. You cannot be a, a, you know, a part-time agent that, oh, I, I do have a, um, you know, a side job or my main job is it's nine to five on a daily, you know, let's say daily basis. And I do commercial on the side. We don't allow that. Uh, we want you to be a full-time commercial agent. Uh, also, you have to belong to the commercial board of realtors that within uh in georgia that is the main dedicated to commercial only board that we have some of the other boards they do have a commercial division within them uh, but it's not a fully dedicated commercial so the one we have here in the metro atlanta is the um, commercial board of realtors um, so i strongly suggest that you belong uh, or you become members of it you can actually become members at a secondary board so if you are members, let's say of, I'm also a member of Neymar, uh, but in my case, I have Neymar as my secondary board, uh, just so I can attend certain uh, classes, seminars, et cetera, meetings. My primary board is Atlanta Commercial Board. For you guys that are in residential, you can actually uh, get Atlanta Commercial Board as a secondary board. When you join them as a secondary board, um, you only have to pay your local dues. You don't have to pay your national dues or your state dues because they already have been paid, all right? And I'm talking more so for everybody that is um, a realtor, which is something I strongly suggest you do as well. Um, within our company, everybody that practices commercial, they also have to be realtors. You cannot just be an agent. Um, multiple reasons, but the ethics behind it is a big one, of course. Um, one good thing that when you become a member of the Atlanta Commercial Board in this case. Uh, and by the way, uh, I'm not getting paid a single dime by talking about Atlanta Commercial Board over here. I'm just, we're, I'm a member of it. I like what they do. I like their education. 
uh, component. Um, we we network a lot with our members, and, and I I do like a lot of uh, their technology and their tools. So I think it's a great board. Uh, but going back to it, um, another great thing that when you join the Atlanta Commercial Board, you have access to a totally separate set of um, uh, forms. They have a separate uh, set of commercial forms. Um, nowadays, you can you start getting a little bit more through GAR. GAR has actually done a, a really great job in um, introducing commercial forms uh, that you have access to as a residential agent as well, of course. Um, but Atlanta Commercial has their own as well, a little bit different forms. So that's something that I do like uh, we have access to as well. Um, but like I said before, you don't need a special license. Once you have your uh, Georgia real estate license, that is the, the core or, or, or license that you need to use. Um, but how you stack on top of that license is what makes the difference, the education and the experience you start getting with it. Um, Faith, you had a question? Um, yes, there's a question in the chat. Um, I don't know if you said Faith or Faith, Faith but Faith said, uh, please share all education courses that we can take. I want more education, just not sure where to look for credibility and relevance. Yeah, so um, going back to, again, you know, Atlanta Commercial Board, they have dozens of classes. Uh, majority are free, but they also do have uh, some that you have to pay a nominal fee to it because they do bring some outside you know, speakers um, and sometimes out-of-state speakers as well. But Atlanta Commercial Board is one that I would definitely recommend. They do have a lot of classes um, that, like I said before, they are included in your membership, so you don't have to pay additional for it. Uh, there's also, um, for if you want to go very, very in-depth into the commercial world, um, and this is, this is more so for somebody who has been practicing uh, commercial and they do have the credentials to do it, CCIM is the ultimate, um, I guess, accreditation you can get within commercial. Um, because we are talking a little bit more here on a um, on residential agents uh, transitioning for residential into commercial. Um, I don't want to put a lot of emphasis right now, but if you really want to take it that far, um, I would suggest that you take the route of becoming a CCI member. That will be like the ultimate uh, accreditation you can get in commercial work. Um, any other questions you have, Faith? Um, there was one that said, do you service land lease for commercial development? Um, I don't personally service uh, land leases. Um, you know, in commercial, you have to um, find your niche, right? You have to find your niche. You, you should not be a jack of all trades. Um, and I do see some names over here or people I respect in the business and they can definitely agree with me. Um, you know, in commercial, you have to um, become an expert in a, in, in a particular uh, type of commercial world. You should not uh, be a jack of all trades, right? Because it's going to take you a lifetime to learn everything that entitles one particular um, type of commercial. Um, I don't personally service land leases. Um, I think they're tricky. Um, they work well for, let's say, trophy um, pieces of land. Um, in let's say in town or let's say big intersections, I think they work well for, with it or for it, uh, but I don't personally service them. Um, and Scott asked, can you talk through the steps for transitioning from residential into commercial, specifically to start building before fully transitioning? Yeah, so um, one thing you have to consider when you start working in the commercial world is, do I have the pocket and the stomach, right? Uh, to ride for three, four, six a year without getting that paycheck, right? Uh, it's not like in residential where, you know, every 30 days or so uh, we get our paycheck, right? And commercial doesn't work that way. Um, so you could be, you know, I've, I've had a transaction that it took almost two years to close. So again, obviously I had some other transactions in, in, in the way as well. But that's, that's the first thing you have to consider, okay, do I have some funds that if I don't do any more residential deals, do I have some funds already saved that they will uh, sustain me or help me to go through a few months until I can get that deal closed to begin with? 
Um, two, I would definitely uh, identify um, a commercial, uh, you know, broker or real estate practitioner uh, that knows the business, that have been doing it for some time, and try to shadow them. Just ask them, hey, you know, can I go with you on, on some of these meetings? And I'll say some of the meetings because we do sign confidential agreements with a lot of our clients. Um, for example, if, if I'm representing um, one of my clients, every time I talk about trying to get him some business or some properties, I cannot talk about his business. We do have confidential agreements. And so I have to be very, very careful every time when I'm actually prospecting to get some properties for them, um, what to say or how much I can say, because I cannot talk about their business. That's something that you know we, we signed a confidential agreement on. Um, so talk to, your, uh, to a commercial agent, commercial broker, commercial realtor um, within your company, if, if there's one. If not, you can al always reach outside and, and see if somebody is open and willing to coach you or at least uh, mentor you or um, that you can shadow them. Uh, go to, go to show-ins, go to meetings, um, you know, be right next to them when they're on the phone on conversation so you can start getting the terminologies, the lingo, et cetera. And also the, the adequate, the practices, you know, um, you know, in, in commercial, um, it is always said that the one that speaks first loses the leverage, right? So in commercial, uh, very much so, you should definitely listen more than uh, what you talk. Because once you start talking, you start talking too much, and then you start losing leverage into the deal, leverage into the transaction itself. Um, but going back to uh, Scott's question, find somebody that practices today uh, real estate uh, as a full time, of course, and ask them to uh, if you can shadow them. Hey, listen, do you mind if I sit with you on some of those calls when you're doing some of this research? Can I sit with you so I can see what you're doing, what you look for when you're having conversations, especially when you're having a conversation with a maybe a residential transaction, but that particular buyer or purchaser might be a business owner. There's probably an opportunity over there that as a residential agent, you haven't been able to um, look for the keys to uncover, right? So, and I'll say this to a lot of the residential agents. If you have a, a residential transaction that it's more than, you know, seven, eight hundred, a million dollars, most likely that person, or that buyer is involved in some kind of small business or in a business. And somehow they're involved in a commercial world. So you should approach them that way as well. So hopefully that kind of answers your question. Go ahead, Faith. And then um, we had another question. What do you lean on to keep you educated in the real estate market overall? Uh, you said, what do I mean? What do you lean on? So how do you, how do you stay educated? So multiple things. Um, like I said, I, I actually, um, I check the news every day, of course. So I know what's going on in the commercial world. Uh, I also belong to several, um, in this case, Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups uh, of commercial agents and brokers. Uh, I'm also a member of a couple of organizations that um, I've coached with them in the past. So they have private groups just for agents and brokers that have been through their coaching in the past. Um, so I'm a member of those as well. We, we do have some internal communications in those groups. So I can always, if I have a question specific to a particular deal, uh, or it could be in general, um, I can go to those group, I can post these questions. And, and this, this group is actually nationwide. Um, as a matter of fact, when I went to, my last coaching that I went to was in Dallas, and we had um, people all the way from South America, uh, Spain, uh, Canada, uh, Europe, and probably about 60, 70 percent of the states in, uh, in the United States, uh, there were some people in there from. So again, this is not only nationwide, um, but it was also worldwide. Go ahead, Faith, any other question? Um, we don't have any in the chat. So if anyone has any, submit them in the chat or take yourself off mute and ask um, if there's anything else. I'll, yeah, I'll talk about a couple other um, things. Like for example, um, I, I have like a checklist of, uh, of things that I go through 
let's say in a commercial transaction, a commercial deal, right? And I'll just, um, I'll say them briefly and you'll start noticing a difference of uh, a residential and commercial uh, transactional deal, right? Now, one of the things to remember is that um, in residential, you have to worry about RESPA, right? Uh, Real Estate Settlement and Procedures Act, remember that? So RESPA doesn't actually cover a commercial real estate. And so, so because of this, you know, you have to perform uh, extensive due diligence uh, on the property you're talking about, you're looking to purchase or your client is looking to purchase. Um, you also have to, um, you know, do some due diligence in all the parties involved. Uh, obviously extensive uh, title work, right? You have to do a whole lot more things um, in commercial because you're not fully covered as you are in, in, um, in residential through RESPA. Um, now remember the commercial loans or, or business loans are not covered the same way through RESPA that the ones in residential. Now, there is a caveat to that. You know, if, if you are moving into the multifamily world, you have one to four residential units, you do have your own corporation or company or LLC, but you're still doing a loan, I could be considered maybe that it's on the RESPA, but for the most part in general commercial, it's not. So you're not protected in the same way. So you have to be very, very careful, obviously. Um, you know, the differences are in the purchase and sale agreements. The way we usually start in commercial is we don't jump directly into the uh, purchase and sale agreement like we do in residential where you make your offer in the actual contract itself. In commercial, uh, we typically use what we, it's called a letter of intent. And a letter of intent, it's normally, it could be a one or two pager. Um, and you spelled out the basic terms. What you're trying to do with this particular document is we're trying to get on the same page, okay? We're trying to get on the same page of the basic terms. So that way we're not wasting time. We're not wasting anybody's time because if we cannot get um, on the same page, literally on one page in basic terms, there's no way we're going to be able to agree on a, you know, 20, 60 page contract. And I say 60 because I think the, Longest or largest contract I've had uh, was a lease, and it was, I think it was 68 pages. So that's a lot of reading in there, too, right? Now, like I said, why would you spend your time going through a 68 page um, offer so that you can go start going back to it every time? So instead of that, we just go and do it through a letter of intent. We use a one pager, we spelled out the basic terms that we're looking for or we're looking to offer. And that's what we start negotiations on. Once we agree on those basic terms, then we use that document to create a purchase and sale agreement or uh, a lease agreement. Um, and so that's how we kind of uh, do it that way when we start. Um, obviously, within there, you have to work, you know, be paid attention to the disclosures. Um, disclosures in commercial, um, like I said before, a purchaser over there doesn't have the same consumer protections like you would have in residential. So you have to make sure that you do actually do your due diligence. You, you request all those disclosures, you take your time to go through them. You take your time to go through a preliminary report, a title report. Uh, and this one is super important because in a difference from residential where very rarely you find, let's say an easement on a property in commercial, it's very normal to find easements on a property. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you do that preliminary title report and you have that document back, that report that you can go through it and study it. You wanna make sure you know what's in there uh, as far as easements, uh, liens, encumbrances, whatever it is. You wanna make sure you take your time. Also, when I say take your time, you wanna make sure that you have hired an attorney because you know, a 68 page contract, you know, obviously I don't know it all, um, but a 68 page contract, I can guarantee you it's gonna have a lot of uh, fine printing caveats in there. So you wanna make sure uh, that your client is fully represented, uh, you've covered them and you protected them. So you wanna refer them or um, talk to your in-house attorney if you have one within your company 
or refer them to a commercial attorney that knows what they're doing as well. Um, you know, also within that, the zoning. The zoning is different, right? In residential, pretty much for the most part is residential zoning. Yes, you got the R 100s, 400s, whatever it is for. Um, but in commercial, you have a whole a slew of different zonings, right? Um, in, in commercial, a zoning determines what you can or cannot do with that piece of land uh, or what you can erect as far as a, bit, a building or structure or what you can do out of it. So that's super important um, that you understand the zoning requirements. Um, when I talk about zoning requirements, uh, the first thing you do is go to the county or the city uh, where that property is located. Go through the zoning ordinance. Um, look up, and, and this could be as simple as making a phone call. Um, a lot of the counties and the cities are very, very knowledgeable and, and very open to help you. So just make a phone call, ask them, listen, I, I have, I'm looking at this property for my client. We have this particular questions. What do you suggest? Do you think this will fly or not? Um, can you send me those, um, this, uh, the zoning ordinance so I can look through it? And they'll, believe me, they're more than willing to help you and assist you because of course, they want more businesses within their city and their county. So go through that uh, zoning ordinance. Uh, make sure you understand what entitles, what businesses you can run out of there, what's permitted, what's not, all right? Uh, so take your time on that. Um, natural hazard disclosures, environmental investigations, hazardous material surveys, um, all these are basically reports you're gonna be doing through in the, your due diligence process. Um, all these reports, um, you know, they have obviously um, different information in them. Um, if, you, if your client is financing the property, most likely a lot of these uh, studies or uh, reports are gonna be requested by the bank. Uh, for example, an environmental assessment report, uh, we call it a phase one, typically, an environmental assessment report. It's very uh, common when you're talking, um, let's say mechanic shops or um, places where you par park um, cars or autos or trucks because you are dealing with fluids, you, you're dealing with chemicals. Also, if you're talking about, let's say, um, a laundry cleaners, there's chemicals involved. If you're talking about, let's say, um, manufacturing facilities or warehouses, that uh, they dealt with some kind of chemicals or um, whatever it could be materials, most likely the bank is gonna require an environmental assessment report. They just wanna make sure that that particular um, property, it's not contaminated, right? And it, if it is contaminated and that, let's say phase one report that they do, they find some contamination, then you'll move into a phase two, which could be more costly, there's some soil sample, there's a whole lot to it. I don't wanna to go too deep, but um, all these reports that I'm talking about, typically the buyer will do them through the feasibility study process uh, or time or due diligence is what you know, we, a lot of you know what about. And most of these are actually responsibility of the buyer. So that means that the purchaser or the buyer, it is investing or spending money in all these reports. And we don't even, we're not even sure yet if our business is gonna be able to operate out of there, right? So that's another um, thing that you wanna consider when you talk to your potential client is, listen, once we start this process, not only the earnest money is gonna be higher, but also there's a lot of due diligence uh, materials and studies we're probably gonna to have to do over here that you're gonna to have to foot the bill for those up front. And we're not even sure we're gonna be able to close on this property yet, but you're gonna to have to pay for that appraisal. You're gonna to have to pay an appraisal cost. I would say I don't see them less than $1,500, give or take. It goes up from there on a commercial. Um, on a, um, an environmental assessment phase one, uh, probably somewhere around that much. They kind of start and it goes up from there. Uh, phase two environmental, of course, is going to be, you know, more money because there's, there's, there's more uh, in, involvement in it. There's more parties involved, contractors involved, et cetera. Um, but again, all these studies, all these feasibility studies, is, they're going to have to be paid before we even close. Uh, survey. Hopefully there's a survey to the property. But if there's not one uh, survey to the property, 
majority of the times the responsibility falls on the buyer, on the purchaser. Um, so you want to make sure that the purchaser understands also that a commercial survey, it's not the same price as a residential survey, um, just the same as the a residential uh, appraisal report. It's not the same as a commercial. Um, in a survey, it depends. It depends on how complex uh, the, piece, the, the, the land is or where the property sits. It depends how big. Um, it depends on many um, components, but an Alta survey, it's usually going to range somewhere in the $3,500 or more. I've seen surveys close to $10,000, $10, but of course, there was a lot of acreage, a lot of structures in it. Um, but like I said before, this is money that your buyer has to allocate for, okay? And um, I have a question, another question. Yeah, we, we have a few questions here, um, starting with Scott asked, are there any groups that you would recommend as being the best for basic growth questions to start off? Yeah, so um, some of these groups, um, the, the majority of the group I belong to in terms of, let's say Facebook, for example, they are very specific groups. And because I've actually coached with them in the past, that's why I have access to them. Um, I can look through some of my list. Um, and if, Scott, if you want to uh, just send me a text or send me an email, I'll put my information uh, towards the end in here. Um, and anybody- I'll also include it in the thank you email, so. Gotcha, okay, yeah. And so you'll get my information. You can send me an email. If you have any more questions, I can point you in the right direction And some of them. I'll have to check which ones will um, give you access to if you haven't coached through them in the past. So, because I don't want to put you into one that it, you won't have access to. And then he also had another question, Faith. Uh, yes, Scott also asked, uh, where, do you, where do you find your listings for commercial? Is this a separate MLS? What about your lead? Um, yeah, so nowadays you start seeing a little bit more in the uh, Georgia MLS. Um, you can find still some in uh, FMLS. Let me tell you one of the reasons why a lot of commercial deals don't happen through FMLS. Um, but it's because people hate to pay that extra 0 0.0012, right? Right. Um, so if you're talking a commercial deal of, you know, a million, two, three million, that 0 0.0012 adds up really quick. Um, and also majority of the people that use the FMLS, it's residential. So that's why very rarely you see, you see a lot of commercial um, listings being posted on the FMLS. Georgia MLS, you see a little bit more, um, but also a few of the other ones are uh, LoopNet. Now, LoopNet is the consumer facing side of, let's say, CoStar. CoStar, um, it's probably the largest uh, data holder or data repository in commercial. Um, they are pretty much worldwide. Um, CoStar owns a whole bunch of things. Uh, they own apartments.com, Landwatch, Landwatch, Lands of America, LoopNet, uh, Homes.com, by the way, as well. They also own HomeSnap. Um, and I'm missing like probably 10 other, oh, 10X, which is about, um, um, what is it, um, auctions. And uh, what else? Um, I'm missing probably about 10 other websites that they own. So they own a whole bunch of stuff. They control data. The, I always say that, that the, the business or the entity that controls the data controls the market. And that is so true for CoStar. They control a lot of data. Um, what I do like about uh, CoStar, they have a lot of historical data on property, uh, which is easier for you to do comparables or comps on commercial. Um, without tools like CoStar, um, or Reonomy or Crexy is very, very hard to do comps in commercial, very hard. That's probably one of the toughest jobs to do in commercial is doing some true comparables, not only on the purchasing side, but also on the leasing side. Um, and so if you think you're gonna be involved in commercial uh, on a full-time basis, I would strongly suggest you invest in a lot of these tools. They're not cheap. Um, CoStar, uh, it's around, give or take, let's say $500 a month uh, to access nationwide. Um, Crexy, it's around $300, give or take a month. 
Uh, Rionomy runs around close to that number as well on a monthly basis. So, you know, on just on three tools right there, I went over a thousand dollars. So, and this is per month, by the way. So this is something you have to consider as well. You know, do I have the funds uh, to spend or invest as I go forward? Are you really going to have to be committed uh, to the business and what you're going to be doing so you can start investing? But um, I would say CoStar has probably the majority. Um, LubeNet, LubeNet is, is the consumer facing, which means that the, what people see in LubeNet, it's because the broker has actually paid to market in there. So if I have a listing, if I put it up in CoStar, only the members of CoStar, the paying members of CoStar will be able to see that listing. It doesn't automatically trickles down to LubeNet. If I want the consumer to see my listing in LubeNet, I have to pay to advertise that listing in LubeNet. The same way, well, through Crexy, because I do pay a, prim, a pro membership or premium membership, any listings will be basically uh, consumer facing as well, and I can blast them out. But we also do, uh, we have an internal exchange to, um, to the commercial border realtors, which is a great, it's, it's fantastic to me, it's great. Uh, because you know, you, I get on a daily basis, I get emails from different properties coming into the market that right now they might be off market uh, or they haven't been fully listed yet. So the consumer doesn't know about them yet, but we do get a notification because we are members of the Atlanta Commercial Board. Um, so, so there's a few places, but if you don't have the money or you don't wanna spend the money yet, uh, start looking through George MLS, eh, maybe some FMLS, uh, Craxy, and LubeNet. Those are probably the most common ones out there. Um, also, uh, Eric asked, and you may have answered this a little bit before, right. but maybe just keep, uh, go more in depth. He said, can you recommend any websites or news feeds that you view on a daily basis to stay current on commercial real estate? Yeah, so I can tell you um, a couple. Uh, let's see, um, B-I-S-N-O-W, BizNow. Dot com. That's one that uh, um, I go to every day. Um, I, I'm also, um, I have a subscription to Inman. Although Inman is a little bit more on the residential side, they do talk a little bit sometimes in commercial. So um, I have a membership through Inman.com. So that's another one you, you should check on, on a daily basis. Um, let's see, um, uh, Globe Street, it's another one. And what I'll try to do is, Towards the end here, I'll, I'll put them on the on the chat. Um, but Globe Street is another one. Um, a lot of these uh, news sites, they're nationwide, but you can actually filter uh, which news you wanna um, you know read about. If it is, let's say, only about industrial, only about retail, or if it is Southeast, or if it is Northeast, whatever it is. So you can actually filter uh, what kind of news uh, you can read in there. So hopefully that kind of answered the question in that. Any other questions on that? Um, Michael Malone, did you still have a question? I saw that you used the little hand raise um, expression. Uh, thank you, Faith. No, I don't. Uh, Sergio actually answered all of that um, when he was speaking. So I, I've got the answers to my questions. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Um, Scott just asked, what about his leads? Do they usually come through the website? He has created or other areas. Yeah, so so leads um, in commercial, you have to prospect a lot, right? And the the more education you get and the coaching, you need to understand how to prospect better in commercial. Um, but I'll give you an example. You know, I prospect specifically the majority of the time. I prospect specifically for a type of property because that's what my client is excuse me, my client is looking for. Um, let's say I have, a, um, I have a list of clients and I go through my list and say, okay, um, I have two or three clients in this list that what they're looking for is a, it's similar. So what I do is I put them together and I say, okay, um, let's say I have an automotive group. It's looking for a car dealership. I have another one that's looking for a mechanic shop or a body shop. Well, there's some similarities um, to those operators in terms of the zoning, in terms of the 
uh, of the area or the size of the lot they're looking for. So there's some similarities in, in, in those particular users. So what I do is when I prospect, I prospect for properties that will actually qualify for all of them or the majority of them, right? I'll look for an example. Um, I know that nothing less than an acre is gonna be approved for a car dealership, for example. So I'm not gonna waste my time in looking for properties less than one acre. Uh, because a lot of the counties don't like them or they want to prove it. Now, again, I do my homework and I go through the zoning ordinance of those counties or cities just to make sure that if I'm looking for, let's say, a car dealership or a body shop, what is the zoning that's going to uh, be the best uh, you know, zoning for them or the most suitable? Is it C2? Is it C3? Or is it industrial? M1, M2, whatever it is, I want to do, I do my homework first then I can go and start prospecting for those particular properties. Yes, I do my search on the MLSs, but nowadays we're having the same problem as in residential that um, you know we just don't have a lot of inventory. So you have to create it. Um, so when I start prospecting, I look through either LoopNet or some of the tools that we use to uh, start getting the ownership. Who are the owners of these properties? Um, there's another tool within our company that we provide all of our agents. It's called Spokio. Uh, spoke here, you can actually do, um, it's almost like a skip tracing on people. And um, you can find uh, email addresses, uh, property addresses where they live. You can find phone numbers. Um, is it 100% accurate? No, it's not. Like every other tool out there, it's not. But it's a good starting point. And I'd say 80% of the time, it has been very successful for me, um, where I, I blast an email to, let's say, I identify 10 properties that could be um, a great you know, location for my car dealership or my uh, body shop. So I put them, let's say in an email or I do a letter and I blast them, all those owners and say, hey, I have this particular situation. I have a group or I have a, a, a client that's interested in your property because of this, that or the other. We're willing to pay X number of dollars or market rate, whatever it is. And yes, this is a shotgun effect because, right, you're just using the shotgun and spray out there and see what sticks. But more often than not, you do get answers from a lot of these um, business owners and property owners. You know, even if you get I'm not interested, that's actually a good answer because that means that they're not interested today. Now, however, you have confirmed a contact for that location. So you keep it in your database and guess what you're going to do? Every so many months, you're gonna hit them again. Hey, I know we talked about it you know, a few months ago, but how about now? Would you be interested? The market has changed, right? The market shifted a little bit. I think we can get you some more money for that property. Do you think you might be interested now? So that's another thing you should invest uh, in a good uh, CRM. Uh, so you can keep a good database, a good notes in there. Uh, that's super, super important because uh, like in residential, a, a commercial um, owner or commercial property, it's going to sell. I mean, it, it's going to sell. It's going to sell at some point, right? It's just a matter of time. So you want to make sure that you stay relevant, you stay in front of them. Uh, so whenever that communication or that conversation comes to sell, you're there. You have been there. Your name has been there. You've been in contact with these people. So that's why it's super important for that. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers a little bit on the leads. Yes, there's some places out there you can buy leads, but I would in commercial, I really wouldn't spend money buying leads because commercial, it's so specific. Um, developing your own leads or prospect for your own clients is the best way to do it because like I said, you're looking for something specific for your clients. And when you buy leads, you're not going to get specific leads. It's going to be pretty broad out there. Uh, so that kind of, hopefully that answers your question on that. Any other questions, Faith? Um, I don't see any in the chat, but we still have about 10 minutes left. So yeah. if you have any, um, now's the time to ask. Yeah, I'll talk about commissions, right? Because that's something that everyone wants to uh, know about. Yeah, and yeah. Hear about. yeah so uh, I'll say, for example, a lot of people think, well, what are the... Um, what are the referral fees or, you know, if I refer you some business, what are the referral fees? Well, it depends, right? In commercial, it depends because in, in commercial, I'm going to be working a whole lot more than a residential. 
there's a whole lot more to it than residential. So I personally, and, I, and I'll say this in this group, I cannot pay the referral fees that a residential transaction would pay. I just can't, right? I can and I won't because I do spend a lot of money. I, I invest or spend a lot of money on my tools and my education, in my experience, and I have to spend a lot of time when I'm doing the research. So, you know, paying you 30, 25%, just like in residential, it just doesn't work. It doesn't cut it, especially if I'm taking a, a, a lead on a lead for a lease. Remember that lease pays less than a purchase or sale um, to a certain extent. So if I, you know, if I'm spending a whole lot of time and research to make two or $3,000, but I still have to pay you, you know, 30%, it just doesn't work. It, so I would not uh, do the same as residential uh, referral fees. Um, if, if you're more interested, talk about, you know, very detailed fees, just contact me. I, I can talk to you about that. Um, but let me tell you the difference in uh, commercial uh, commissions today, the rates. Um, they have been compressing a little bit. In the past, you would see a lot of 10 and 8%, 8 to 10%. Still, when I'm going to list the property, I still quote 8 to 10% because there's a whole lot of components in there, right? Obviously, your signs cost more. You spend more time on your tools, like I said before. You're probably going to be spending a lot more in research, outside research, maybe outside um, marketing. You're going to be spending a whole lot more money than just residential. So that's why you need to get paid more. Also, if you are going to um, you know, cooperate in that commission with the other broker, you wanna make sure that there is a good incentive for that other broker to do all of that work too, right? Now, big difference, uh, big difference from residential and commercial, your commission is not protected, okay? So if, you're, if you don't know what you're doing, when you get to the table, you can walk out with zero in your pocket right? You're not protected like in residential. You, you want to make sure from day one that you already talked about with the other party, hey, are you guys offering a uh, co-op over here? How much is it? What's the requirements to get it, right? What if I send my client and or my client saw that property first with you and I'm still going to be able to collect that money or not? So you want to make sure you do your due diligence in that commission section, right? But again, it, it depends on the property. It depends on the price. Um, I see 3% usually where, you know, it's a sizable amount over a million dollars. Um, but I've also seen, uh, you know, 7% commissions. So it depends. It depends on the deal itself. It depends on the location, how long it's been on the market, uh, how much time includes in there. Um, also, it depends if I'm going to get all my commission from the seller or from the buyer. It is normal in commercial that you get commission from the purchasing side. And most of your clients uh, in, in commercial understands that too. And if they don't, it's your fault. So you wanna make sure you make them understand that, listen, I'm gonna try as much as possible to get my fees, my compensation from the seller side, but there's a possibility that you might have to cover some. If we get to that point, I'll let you know, or this is how it works. So make sure you have that discussion with them up front. Um, in terms of uh, leases in, com in commercial and how much you get paid, um, I'll give you an example. Nowadays, if you're talking, let's say industrial site warehouses, uh, they're normally paying around the first month base rate rent plus 4% of the total aggregate base uh, commission. I'll explain that in English now. So let's say that your rent is $5,000 uh, per month. That's the base rent, not the triple net, right? Because that's the additional rent. Triple net is net on insurance, taxes, and maintenance for the most part. But let's just say on the base, it's $5,000 a month. And uh, times 12, that's $60,000. And let's say that we're doing um, a five-year lease. So six times five. That's 300,000. So your commission is going to be based off 300,000 because that's the total based rents. And out of there, it's going to be normally, uh, let's say that your commission is 4%. That's what, $12,000 plus your first month, which was what? 5,000, I said, right? So in that particular scenario, 
let's say somebody that signed a uh, five-year lease deal paying $5,000 a month, give or take your commission, it's about $17,000. Now, we try to get all that commission up front, but it doesn't always happen. Sometimes you have to negotiate that commission to maybe come in in chunks of in payments. Uh, it could be a quarterly payment. It could be monthly. I've been involved in monthly situations where I was receiving a monthly check for about a year and a half until we converted that lease into a purchase. Then I was able to cash out the entire um, commission. But in the meantime, the, the owner was paying it per month. Why? Because the tenant we put in there at that time was a brand new tenant. Um, they didn't have, their business wasn't um, you know, running yet. So the liability or the risk was much higher for the uh, landlord. So they decided to pay the commission on a monthly basis. Why? Well, because if the tenant after six months stopped paying, guess what? You stop collecting your, your commission too. So I try as much as possible to collect my, uh, my commission up front, but most of the time you collect 50% of your commission when all the agreements are signed. Um, and the remaining 50% of your commission you collected most of the time after um, any uh, concessions, let's say like free rents or contingencies or anything like that. After that time has elapsed, then you typically get your remaining 50% of your commissions. So um, a commercial lease could be a lucrative business to get in because those are typically done much faster than a purchase. Uh, in, a, in a purchase, there's a whole lot more components to it. So in I would say if you really want to start trying more the waters into the commercial world, probably start looking more into the commercial leases. Get with someone uh, that that's what they're doing today and uh, ask them to, uh, if you can shadow them, you know, um, get on some phone calls with them, see what kind of research they're doing, go to properties with them. So you can start listening the way they're talking. Um, go to properties where in the middle of a renovation or, um, or on an improvement, right? Um, just to see what are the uh, commercial uh, contractors are doing different than the residential contractors doing. And anyway, this is just a tip of the iceberg. Um, I know we're coming into the two o'clock. I appreciate everybody uh, for joining us today. Do you have any other questions, Faith, for me? Um, I don't see any, but if anyone has any, this is um, the, your final time to speak up. Okay, we do have one. Are you seeing landlords reducing or refusing to pay commissions on leases, whether they have a broker or not? What are you seeing? Um, so the, the simple answer is yes, because the market has been a little bit more compressed nowadays. Um, you see some of the landlords reducing those commissions. Um, I was involved in a recent transaction where uh, we spent a whole lot of time, uh, close to four months, and all we got paid was like $2,400. And I mean, yeah, $2,400, I'll take it all day long. But when you start putting the amount of time you put into the deal and how long it takes, sometimes you have to say no to some deals because at the end of the day, you end up in the red. Uh, but yes, to answer your questions, yes, I start seeing that some of those commissions have been a little bit more compressed. Thank you. And then we also had, um, how do I refer you business, your contact info. So we will include um, Sergio's contact information in the thank you email, which will go out um, most likely tomorrow or by the end of today. So um, be on the lookout for that. But uh, thank you for joining us, Sergio, and um, providing a whole bunch of valuable information. Um, also, this has been recorded, so we will be posting it to our YouTube so you can rewatch it um, and yeah, so we will update you when that is live. Thank awesome. you so thank much, you so much. Thank and thank you, you for everyone thank you for joining for your us. Time. Thank you, Doc, for your time. Appreciate everybody's uh, time today. Yes. Thank you, you. Know, uh, thank you for being uh, being the guest on our show today. We appreciate your comments and your insight. And Faith, thank you for filling in for me as moderator today. I appreciate your help as well. And to everyone else, uh, my advice is to go forth and conquer. Uh, knowledge is power, and I hope that uh, you. it's been an hour well spent for you. Hopefully we look forward so. to catching up with you again soon. And Faith, if you'll just uh, email everyone and let them know when the uh, uh, YouTube video is posted. Yep, I will do that. All right. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.